How can you predict a serial killer? In hindsight, the warning signs can seem obvious, but in the moment, it's impossible to tell who even the most troubled child will grow up to be. More often than not, they'll grow into functioning members of society, but every once in a while, those patterns that they developed as a child show up in future crime scenes. And suddenly, you discover that your drinking buddy at the local tavern is actually the notorious co-ed killer, responsible for the deaths of 10 people. Born in Burbank, California in 1948, Edmund Emil Kemper III quickly had a troubled childhood. His mother, Clarnell Stramberg, was an alcoholic who divorced his father while Kemper was still young and allegedly abused her son. Despite being marked as an extremely intelligent child, Kemper showed early psychopathic tendencies. He had a tendency to torture and kill animals, specifically when he killed and decapitated the family cat at just 10 years old, and when he killed a second family cat just three years later. It's been reported that Kemper's mother would lock him in the basement for months at a time, which some sources report was done out of fear that Kemper would hurt or molest his sisters. Kemper ended up living with his paternal grandparents after running away from home to find his biological father, who sent him away once Kemper found him. According to Kemper, his grandmother was also abusive and controlling towards him. This led to a self-expressed dislike and distrust of women, as he hated both his mother and grandmother. Some psychiatrists have claimed that they believe that Kemper being sent away to his grandparents' home may have been what triggered his first kill, as it was a major rejection from his mother and father. In 1964, Ed Kemper shot and killed his grandmother at the age of 15. He continued to then kill his grandfather out of fear that he would be upset to learn of his wife's death. Kemper was sent to the Atascadero State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in 1964 and was released into his mother's care in 1969 at the age of 21. At the hospital, he was supposedly considered a favorite among the staff due to his intelligence and his ability to follow the rules. Later in life, Kemper claimed that he learned many tactics from other inmates during his stay at Atascadero, which he would use on victims in later attacks. According to the New York Times, in later murder hearings, a psychiatrist would say that He was unusually intelligent, and this had helped him get out of confinement previously after he had killed his grandparents. Three years later, Kemper's killing spree would begin. It was this string of murders that would dub him the co-ed killer. On May 7, 1972, Kemper picked up two young Fresno State students together, Marianne Pesch and Anita Lucesa. He told them he would drive them to Stanford, but instead drove them to Alameda and proceeded to kill them via strangulation and stabbing. He placed their bodies in his trunk and took them back to his apartment where he dismembered, sexually violated, and photographed their dismembered corpses. On September 14, 1972, Kemper picked up 15-year-old Aiko Ku and promised to take her to dance class. At one point during the drive, Ku was actually able to lock Kemper out of his car, but after hours of pleading, Kemper convinced her to open the door. He then strangled, assaulted, and dismembered her before disposing of her remains near Bonnie Doon. Even after this close call, Kemper attended an appointment with state psychiatrists where they declared him no longer a danger to the public. Kemper finally got what he wanted. They officially sealed his juvenile record. Ku's decapitated head was in the trunk of Kemper's car during this appointment. On January 8, 1973, Kemper picked up Cynthia Cindy Shawl, an 18-year-old Cabrillo College student. He shot her, brought her body back to his mother's home, dismembered her, and repeatedly sexually assaulted her corpse. He buried her decapitated head in his mother's garden, facing his mother's bedroom so that she could look up to her. The rest of her body was found washed up on the beaches of Santa Cruz and Big Sur. On February 5, 1973, Kemper picked up UC Santa Cruz students Rosalind Thorpe and Allison Alice Leo, ages 23 and 20 respectively. At this point, authorities were issuing warnings against hitchhiking with strangers and were telling students to only hitchhike with other UCSC students. However, Kemper's mother happened to work there, so his car had a UCSC sticker on it. He brought Thorpe and Leo's bodies back to his mother's house after shooting them, where he dismembered them and sexually assaulted their bodies. Kemper's final two victims were not, in fact, co-eds. In April of 1973, he killed his mother by bludgeoning her with a claw hammer. He then dismembered her and had sex with her decapitated head. Kemper proceeded to throw darts at her head, screamed at it for hours, and even put his mother's larynx in the garbage disposal, later saying, Even when she was dead, she was still bitching at me. I couldn't get her to shut up. 
He also claimed that he murdered his mother to spare her the embarrassment that she would face if she had lived to see him be arrested. Kemper then invited his mother's friend, Sarah Sally Hallett, over and killed her. Kemper's ultimate capture was not the result of a detective cracking the case. In fact, despite being questioned by the police, he was never considered a suspect in any of the murders. The only reason he was ever questioned was because he purchased a 44 Magnum handgun. The Gun Control Act of 1968 forbade felons and mental incompetence from purchasing firearms. So, the police were alerted to Kemper's purchase due to his juvenile record. The police just wanted to know why his past crimes weren't mentioned on the paperwork for his gun. Kemper cooperated with the police, explaining how he had his record sealed and handed over his weapon until they could clarify the paperwork confusion. Throughout his entire spree, Kemper was a regular at the jury room, which was a bar frequented by law enforcement. He was so close with the regulars there, some of whom were assigned to his murders, that the officers nicknamed him Big Eddie. Following the murder of his mother and her friend, Kemper went on the run. He listened to the radio, waiting for the story of the killings to break. But when he reached Pueblo, Colorado, and hadn't heard anything, he turned himself in by calling the police from a payphone. At first, law enforcement thought he was pulling a prank. There's no way Big Eddie could be a murderer. It took Kemper multiple phone calls and sharing information that only the co-ed killer would know to convince the police that he was the culprit. He eventually directed them to the bodies of his mother and her friend. He was arrested on April 24th, 1973, at the age of 24, and immediately confessed to all eight of his recent murders in great detail. Kemper was charged with eight counts of first-degree murder in October of 1973. His public defender, James Jackson, initially tried to argue that Kemper was not guilty by reason of insanity. Kemper never denied committing his crimes, but did claim insanity the entire trial. However, psychiatrists that assessed Kemper disagreed, ruling him legally sane and aware that his actions were wrong. As reported by the New York Times, the judge presiding over the trial said, I know you are not bragging. I know you were speaking in anguish and remorse. May God have mercy on your soul, Mr. Kemper. But you have to protect the rest of the people from people like you. Kemper was found guilty of all eight charges and was given multiple life sentences on November 9, 1973. When the judge asked Kemper what he thought his sentence should be, he said, Death by torture. However, capital punishment was under moratorium at the time. It's very possible that Ed Kemper could have gotten away with his crimes, and his story doesn't end with his capture. During his early years in prison, he became part of a new method of data collection that helped the FBI create better serial killer profiles. He gave interviews on his childhood, thought processes, motivations, and feelings surrounding his murders. His interviews, along with others, helped establish certain patterns for profiles, such as the fact that many serial killers share the experience of torturing or killing animals as children. He was also a partial inspiration for movie killers such as Michael Myers and Buffalo Bill, and was made into a prominent character on the Netflix show Mindhunter. In reality, Kemper went on to become head of a prisoner program that produced audiobooks for the blind, and his voice has narrated over 5,000 hours of audiobooks. And as of 2021, Edmund Kemper is still serving his sentence at California Medical Facility in Vacaville at 72 years old. <laughs>